In the previous lesson, we introduced some of the work and some of the writings in ontology of that of the philosopher Quine. Now, what we're going to do in this lesson is actually start to unpack his writings in more detail, talking about this idea and the proposition that we are going to be discussing of non-existent objects and the ways in which you can have an ontological commitment to a non-existent object. And it's quite interesting because one of the things that you have to think about when you're doing ontology is trying to work out ultimately what you're committed to as an ont ontologically committed to i.e. what you believe to exist. And when we look at things like non-existent objects, you will see why this is such an interesting philosophical problem um, and one that Quine um, likes to, uh, to, to, to talk about it quite a lot in his considerations. Specifically in the question of what there is and his paper, what there is, um, he discusses whether or not non-existent objects exist. Now, you might think this is quite counterintuitive, almost paradoxical even, to suggest that non-existent objects exist. But it's not talking about whether or not they actually exist physically, but more so whether or not an individual can be or should be ontologically committed to the truth statement of propositions, which states that a non-existent object exists, or that a non-existent, or, or maybe a proposition where the statement of the proposition uh, discusses um, the existence or the properties of a non-existent object or entity. We'll talk in more detail about this concept and how Quine deals with this philosophical issue, because it really speaks to some of the ways in which he approaches ontology more broadly, some of the questions that we're going to explore in future lessons time. So let's begin. Non-existent objects. What do I mean by non-existent objects? Well, when Quine wrote his paper on what there is, he talks about one of the most co common ontological viewpoints. That is the view that non-existent entities can exist. Okay, um, He does so uh, and looks at the following platonic thought experiment an argument relating to the existence of non-existent entities. He asks us to consider propositions like the following. So what about this following proposition here? The proposition Santa does not exist. Okay, the statement in its entirety. Now, unfortunately, um, for those of you who are big fans of Christmas, um, Santa does not exist. This is a true proposition. Okay, but then if it is true, and we can suggest that it is true, because uh, if you're an adult, uh, or, or if you're not, if you, uh, for those of you who thought it was um, false, um, I'm sorry, but it is true. Um, if it is true, then at the very least, it must be a proposition which has meaning. It must be a meaningful proposition because no proposition which is true cannot be can be meaningless. You can't have a meaningless true proposition according to general basic understandings of philosophy of language. And so as a result of which, if it is true, then it is meaningful, at the very least meaningful. If it is meaningful, if the proposition is meaningful, then it must be the case that each part of the sentence itself has meaning. So not only is the proposition in its entirety something that has meaning, but the component parts of the proposition must also have meaning. So Santa does not exist. Each of those individual component parts must have their own individual meaning in order for the proposition as a whole to have its meaning in general. Because this speaks to the argument that you can't derive meaning in a sentence from meaningless uh, contributions to the sentence. So if everything in the sentence is meaningless, then you can't all of a sudden make meaning from that proposition. Um, that is a debated, obviously, in philosophy. Don't forget that this is metaphysics, so all of it is debatable. Um, but it is interesting how that is how um, essentially we, we, we kind of think about uh, meaningful statements and, and how statements have potential meaning. Now, if that is the case, therefore, that the proposition is meaningful and it must be meaningful in the case that each part of the sentence has meaning in and of itself, then it suggests that the word Santa in the sentence means something. It has some kind of meaning. And so essentially what this meaning is, is a name. It means it's a meaning which involves the fact that it is a name, it is a name of a thing. Um, because it is a name, it names a thing. The thing okay, is Santa, okay, that thing is Santa itself. Now the question here therefore is that by accepting the proposition Santa does not exist, we are ontologically committed to the idea that things do not exist, that things that do not exist, sorry, do exist, okay, because if we say that something has meaning, 
and the thing that we're naming here is the the, the the name of Santa and we are naming something that something is Santa and so um, how can we say that it does not exist if we can name it and then the name of that thing has some kind of meaning and so we are ontologically committed to the idea that things that don't exist exist um, seems quite paradoxical um, uh, how can something which does not exist actually exist? We know that it doesn't exist, but we seem to have to be somehow ontologically committed to its existence. Well, what Quine does is attempt to bring an answer to this by looking at a number of possibilities. Okay, How can we get around this paradox? What ways can we resolve this paradox um, in a satisfying manner? Well, he outlines two positions a philosopher could take. Both appear to be at least prima facie convincing and reasonable. Uh, prima facie, for those of you who don't know Latin or don't care to ever want to learn Latin, uh, just means on its face. Okay, so um, often those of you who study law will 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 come across language such as prima facie. Um, so. Both of these propositions that a philosopher could take that Quine uh, proposes appear to be on their face convincing and reasonable. First one is that Santa is not a concrete object which exists in the concrete world, but rather Santa is something of an idea that exists in everybody's minds. We have a sort of collective memory of what Santa is, and so it could be described as something of an abstract entity. So suggesting that Santa exists um, it does not necessarily entail that we are saying that Santa is an actual character, an actual person, that exists in the real concrete world. We could come to the conclusion instead that the existence, the ontological commitment to the existence is not ontologically committing us to a concrete object, but rather ontologically committing us to an idea in our minds. So um, Santa does not exist in the real world, but it seems I can have a, an, an idea of what Santa is and that this is a consistent idea that is shared across everybody who understands the basic concept, okay? A jolly man coming down a chimney putting presents under a tree. Now, Quine rejects this viewpoint that when you are talking about ontological commitments, you can be focusing on maybe concrete versus abstract entities. Um, he argues that it is convincing to suggest that these non-existent objects just exist in our minds and have some kind of mental existence, um, some kind of mental experience, if you will, some kind of qualia, for example. Um, this is because the whole argument for the existence of non-existent entities is based on our acceptance of the proposition that Santa does not exist. And so as a result of which, nobody is saying that the idea of Santa does not exist. This argument is therefore drawing our attention away from the real philosophical issue to discuss something which is not contentious okay so the nobody is saying that the idea of santa does not exist in this proposition we're saying that santa does not exist we are almost um intuition pumping a concrete entity into the sentence itself okay um and so the therefore the response in the first proposition isn't very convincing what about quine's second response well, Quine suggests that um, that entities such as Santa are what he describes as, quote, unactualized possibility. It's just like any other entity that exists, but instead they lack the properties of actuality and existence. OK, uh, we will see in a second that Quine has an objection to this as well. But what we see here is that the entity itself we can have an ontological commitment to and that when we think about ontology and when we think about uh, whether or not something exists um, and what objects and entities do exist we are essentially it's ascribing to those entities the properties of actuality and existence so just like something like my pencil has the property of um of, of being straight for example it has a quite hard po uh, uh, property it's orange in terms of the color these are properties that we can ascribe to a concrete object okay it has functional properties so the function of a pencil for example is to write and to draw but what quine suggests here in this in this proposition in this in this response is that all of these concrete objects this pencil that i'm holding in my hand for example doesn't just have these properties that we can ascribe simply like things like color and and, and consistency and, and 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 rigidity and all these kinds of things but it also has the property of actuality and the property of existence so just like my pencil is orange it has the property of orangeness it also has the property of existence and the property of actuality 
okay? And Santa is an example that we can think of as an entity that we have um, ontological commitments to uh, in terms of at least the proposition of its lack of existence. And we can have um, properties that we can ascribe to Santa in terms of being male, being a human, being um, somebody who goes down the, a tree at Christmas, being a Christmas character, but that we do not ascribe the property of actuality and existence to um, this individual. Quine also rejects this proposition, and essentially the proposition that is levied in the second premise, in the second idea, is appealing to a distinction which is made between objects which are actual and those which are possible. Okay, so when we say that Santa doesn't exist, we are not necessarily making a claim about such entities. We are making a claim about things which are possible but not actual. And so what this does is develop a wholly different understanding of the philosophy behind all of these ideas. Because what is happening here is that the argument that is being made is that there are some things which are actual and that this is just a subset of what is possible so that when we are talking about making ontological commitments we might have a whole slew a whole array of various modal claims that you can make about the possibility of various existing things and 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 things that are potentially act actualizable and could be actualizable and then we go one step deeper and say that there is a subset of things which are possible and those are the things that are actual this is an interesting um, uh, uh, objection that Quine also has. And so as a result of all of this, Quine begins by rejecting the idea that there is a distinction between being and a distinction between existence in this way. And so at the end of the day, what is the difference between something being and something existing? Um, so something in the real world being a thing um, versus a, a thing that exists. OK, um, Quine argues that existence isn't a feature of an object, okay? It is a feature which is lacking by some things, okay? So um, when I say, for example, that the pencil that I have in my hand has various different properties, it has the property of rigidity, it has the property of being straight, it has the property of um, being um, serving a particular function, for example, it has the colour property of being orange, um, uh, and I also made the point that it has the property of being real or the property of uh, actuality or the property of existence. Quine argues that this isn't true. Quine argues that existence isn't a feature. It isn't a property of an object. Rather, it is the lack of existence, which is something that is had by things that don't exist, like like Santa. So rather than it being a thing that things have, it is a th it is the lack of that think that some things don't have. If that makes if that makes any sense at all. Now, ultimately, Quine is saying that conflating the idea of existence with the idea of actuality is actually distorting our traditional notion of the word existence. OK, and so um, it is certainly true that we can draw an identity between existence and being using logic. So, for example, if we were to write this particular uh, little um, piece of first order logic here, what we are saying is that there exists something that is X. That little inverse, reverse, reflected uh, letter uh, E there um, is known as the existential quantifier. Um, and in first order logic, we use existential and universal quantifiers. Um, the existential quantifier talks about and essentially ascribes a property to the variable, the variable there being X, and the property that is being ascribed is the property of existence. It means that there exists something that, and that thing is X. OK, the universal quantifier is just an upside down letter A. And that says that for all things X, X shares some kind of property, for example. OK, there is an X that has this kind of property. And that's what first order logic is telling us. Now, it is clearly true that these statements are simply referring to the same thing. And so what we have to think about, therefore, in a little bit more detail in future lessons, is the concept of being able to come up with and develop ontological commitments using logic, using first order logic. And this comes and brings us into the fold, uh, one of the Quinean methods of ontological commitments, which is known as the process of regimentation, which we'll get to in future lessons time.